So we are looking backward to the <coughs> crib of the Western society in which Americans were looking for their own origins. And they found in Sicily the crossroads, as it was, as being in the history uh, of Europe, and so United States, and in Shasha, the personification of someone that was seated in Rakal Muto waiting for American intellectual crossing the Atlantic, going to him, asking many questions and sharing the idea of literature on the both sides of the Atlantic. And so I'm very happy to introduce you Francesca Maria Corrao, there's a professor of Arabic language and culture at the Lewis University in Rome in the Department of Political Sciences. Her research focuses on Arab countries' literature, history, and culture. She has extensively published on Arabic poetry and theater, and she's the co-editor of the fourth volume of Polsky book series Shasha Scrittore Europeo of the Associazione Amici di Leonardo Shasha. And this volume that you can see on the desk where Penny Brucoleri is, is on the relationship between the Sicilian writer and the Arab world, published in 2021, entitled Un Arabo che ha letto Montesquieu, Leonardo Sciascia e il Mediterraneo Sud Orientale. So please join me to welcome Professor Francesca Maria Corrao. Thank you very much, Valerio. Thank you very much to the director of Italian Institute of Culture, to the her lady ambassador, and uh, but thank you very much for the uh, the president, the friends of the Ami uh, Amici uh, of uh, Leonardo Sciascia, because they gave me the chance to go back to my memories, and so uh, I was. Uh, forced to shift from Arabic studies interest to our Mediterranean shared interest and of course literature and Leonardo Sciascia. Um, I profit that I had few minutes, uh, a few minutes earlier so that I can open my mail. So why Leonardo Sciascia and me? But for a very simple reason, I mean, I will not take you long, but uh, since we, I was very, very young, I, I, I used to know Leonardo Sciascia because he was a friend of my father, not friends only as uh, people of the same generation fighting together against mafia or uh, sharing ideals of socialism and the uh, possibility of rebirth for uh, Sicilian people who came out from the war uh, in a very poor uh, condition, as we heard before. Uh, but also because he was saying many times at home when I was a kid, and the, uh, and the first written sign of this memory is uh, his translation of Machado in Italian, and it goes back to 1967. And um, just one month later, there was the earthquake in Sicily in the area of Trapani, and Gibellina was uh, at the core of this terrible event. Uh, by chance, and history, my father became later on this mayor of this small city. And the people of that place were so poor that nobody would have cared for them. But there was this beautiful group of intellectuals who were part of is this Sicilian um, Salon Littéraire, which was held in my house, my father's house. And uh, among them was Leonardo Sciascia, Carlo Levi, um, um, Guttuso, and uh, Ugo Attardi, and Cagli, Ungaretti, and many others. But of course, for the Sicilian, it was extremely important uh, for them being young and active to do something for the people, for the poor people, and, and transform that tragedy in a chance uh, to, for a new rebirth. And in fact, the old men, men met in Gibellina uh, upon a call and a manifesto that they wrote together, Ludovico Corrao, that was, that was my father, and uh, Leonardo Sciascia and Carlo Levi, uh, asking the intellectual, the Italian intellectual, to do something for those poor people who had been abandoned by the government, the Italian government at that time was not ready to face that tragedy. Um, how to answer to tragedy, how to give an answer and hope to people who had been destroyed 
by grief. And this was their wonderful ideas to answer with art. What kind of art? Each one could do something, each one of them. And of course, Gutuzo made a beautiful painting. Leonardo Sciascia wrote wonderful articles on the journal L Lora, as there was a very important newspaper at that time in Palermo, something like Paese Sera in Italy. And, um, and it is quite interesting to remember that Leonardo, when he wrote about what was going on in Gibellina, he was making a comparison between the lager of the poor Jewish people in Germany and the, where, the place where the poor people after the earthquake were living in, in Gibellina and all the small cities of the area. Um, so uh, writings, poetry, poems, but, uh, art, artists com of coming from all over Italy, they gave their contribution to build a new city that now is known all over the world because uh, uh, Alberto Burri created the Cretos. That is uh, something like uh, a huge, beautiful uh, cloud, white cloud of cement on the old city, uh, city in order to keep alive the memory. And here we come to the point uh, the importance of memory in uh, uh, Leonardo Sciascia's legacy. Uh, as I remember that in their discussion at that time, the Mediterranean was extremely important because, uh, of course, we all remember that in the late 60s and the beginning of the 70s, the Mediterranean was uh, again and at the certain world, uh, at the center of the world attention because uh, there was the famous Battle of Algier by Gino Pontecorvo and the, the history of Nasser and Bangun conference, which had been 10 years before, but anyway, uh, were giving hope to all these young generation, uh, I, I would mention, for instance, um, uh, Giovanni Pirelli, who, may, who had uh, played an important role in the uh, fight uh, for freedom of the Algerian people. And, uh, and, and Shasha was uh, writing on the news, uh, newspaper uh, Laura, but also in many uh, among his memories about uh, the hope uh, this uh, newly uh, uh, created Arab nations uh, uh, with their will to to, to gain again a, um, a place in world history, and um, and in fact uh, for Shasha uh, that was inspiring because that made him think that we needed to create a library, a library where we could collect books from uh, from the Mediterranean culture with Spanish, French, Arabic, and so forth books in order to, uh, to give the opportunity to our, to our students, to our kids, not to forget where we come from and to keep having in our heart the dream to create something better after what we have uh, received uh, as an heritage. Uh, this idea of the library of the Mediterranean is written in a, uh, in a letter to Bodini, uh, and he, in fact, was translating this, he started translating poet, poems from Machado as a sign of his will to give a personal contribution to this idea. Uh, well, uh, Ludovico Corrao built Gibellina with the support, important spiritual and physical support of Italian intellectuals, and among them Shasha. And Shasha kept coming to Gibellina many times, and uh, he also became citizen of Gibellina at a certain point. Um, but the thing my father could do uh, was uh, to create the famous library. And this library is there now, keep growing, of course, and it is at the Fondazione Orestiedi of Gibellina, where, he, um, where Corrao did not create only a library, but he created a museum, a museum where there is a wonderful collection of art crafts of the Mediterranean. Why art crafts? Uh, and this is something else that my father took uh, out from the discussion they were making when they were young intellectuals working together in Palermo. Uh, the idea that uh, 
art in Sicilian has a double meaning. It is not only art in the sense of beauty, a beautiful production from artists, but it's also the result of handcraft. So that means artisans, very simple people, in their creative production, they are giving the world, uh, they're transmitting to the world the importance, not only of beauty, but beauty connected to something which is useful, used daily life. Because art, beauty, and good are living within our lives daily. And each one of us is important in making uh, a world history that is based on humanities, a new humanism. This was their dream, to create a new humanism in order to answer back to the violent, the first of wars. Because of course, from one side, we had very witnessed, uh, we had heard until now, about the reaction against war in Vietnam. But there was also a positive and important contribution to what would be uh, how to create a new culture in order to counteract against the, uh, a culture of war. Uh, and what is important is to focus on exactly on library, on art, and uh, cultural activity, which can stimulate uh, and uh, um, give the feeling to each one of us uh, of the importance of people, even humble people, uh, and their role in this keeping on building bridge of dialogue between our past and our future and our friends. Um, another important activity of Shash intellectual uh, life in Palermo uh, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, um, 90s not because he unfortunately died uh, earlier, um, it was uh, the participation to the Congresses. Because uh, in the 80s, uh, um, Antoni Antonino Buttitta was uh, the dean of the Faculty of Literature in Palermo. And, and together with Elvira Sellerio, they had an, an important triangle of intellectual in production. Uh, because uh, uh, they were. Um, Nino Butita was organizing congresses. He was an, anthropo an anthropologue. And uh, at these congresses uh, had the, uh, a, a publication side, which was supported by Shasha and Elvira Sellerio. And, uh, and that was the time where I, uh, I was studying at the uh, uh, school of Antonino Butita. And of course, uh, uh, with, with, with Shasha, we had the time and the possibility uh, to keep uh, meeting and discussing to beg together about what? About the Mediterranean, because by then I was an elder lady, and uh, I'd been um, I'd been followed my dream of the Mediterranean, and I'd been studying Arabic, and I was working in uh, in the 80s, 87 on uh, on one of my first book, which was on Arab poetry in Sicily, and, and this was not the chance because uh, uh, Leonardo Sciascia was writing about Arab poet in Sicily in the 70s, because he had found, uh, thanks to his uh, correspondence with uh, Francesco Gabrielli, who was a famous uh, Arabist in Italy at that time, and Umberto Rizzitano, who was the famous Arabist in Palermo, he had come to know um, Ibn Hamdis, who was a Sicilian. Arab who lived in the 11th century. And, uh, and, and he was uh, amazed to learn you know, something more about the Arabs because of course there, were, there was this political fascination I mentioned before, but then it became an intellectual and literary uh, fascination uh, thanks to Ibn Hamdis and the, translate, the translation which were published in, this, in those years. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and also <laughs> because then I became, uh, let's say, um, a bridge of connections because uh, um, I was studying in Cairo. I discovered that at the American University, I discovered that we were not, there was not only Ibn Hamdi's legacy um, in, uh, in Sicily, but there was another important story. That was Juha. Jufa is uh, a fool a cunning fool, uh, is the hero of uh, anonymous stories, uh, which we 
we learned they were of Arabic, Arabic origins, but being Sicilian, we didn't know that. We thought they were only Sicilian. And uh, Shasha loved Jufa because his grandfather was telling him the story of Jufa when he was young. And, and, and these were typical stories grandpa or grandma would say to the kids before going to bed. So just to forget the, the evil events of the day and laugh about foolishness before going to sleep. And, and, um, and he was very surprised to learn from me that he was not Sicilian, but it was Arab. And, uh, and that, it, in fact, it became uh, a part of my field of studies. And, uh, and the publication, of course, this book was later published for, uh, by Celerio, by Elvira. And, uh, and, 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 and Shasha wrote the, the introduction. Uh, and in this introduction, it, it, there is the summary of what I'm telling you about. <laughs> now, in the sense that he was uh, uh, giving an importance to this, uh, the, the role of the, the folklore, of the importance of, of the people commitment and the role of the, uh, the artisans. And the, and the fact that uh, art has to see with daily creating, creation. And, uh, and, and the fact that we as human beings, we are full and wise at the same time, and that gives courage, especially for the kids, that in, those in fact are key stories for kids um, uh, for, um, to appreciate the fact that you can make mistakes in life, but then you always have a second chance and you can win over your difficulties. And, uh, and in fact, this was uh, uh, a myth for Sicilian kids, and, and this was uh, uh, a narration that uh, Shasha uh, wanted to, uh, to, to, um, to spread and, and to remind, to keep remembering you know, against uh, the risk of being forgotten because, uh, because Jufa was uh, such a, a stupid fool that nobody would give any attention, pay attention to him. And in fact, uh, in the uh, Raccolta Il Mare Color del Vino, the sea uh, wine color, uh, there is a story which is entitled Joha, Jufa. Uh, what is great from uh, um, a literary point of view, the contribution of this tale? So in Arabic it is, Seven lines tale. It's very. It's an anecdote. It's very small, and he made out of it a beautiful uh, short story, and he adapted this universal story. Um, if you're curious and I have time, I'll tell you the story. But now I go straight to the point of Shasha's contribution from an intellectual perspective. Uh, he was, as I said, uh, interested in Mediterranean culture, but uh, um, his ideas of translation or an adaptation was uh, strongly rooted on principle of beauty and uh, extremely uh, attention to the style, uh, something that he he took from uh, from Flaubert, which was uh, one uh, among his favorite writer. Um, and so, going back to this short story, he reproduced and and uh, adapted the story to a Sicilian environment, a Sicilian environment of the Middle Age, uh, where the coming fool is uh, the hero. The hero uh, that, thanks to his foolishness, can uh, revenge against the bishop who was stealing the money from the poor people. And this is, uh, in my opinion, uh, humble opinion, because I am not specialized in Italian studies, so I am taking these ideas from Camporesi, who was a master, a mentor on uh, study on folklore literature in Italy, in especially the, the age, uh, uh, the Middle Age. Um, we are in the 70s. And let's say that Shasha was among the first who had the courage to attack the church. Let's not forget that after the Second World War, it was difficult to attack the church. We had Christian democracy making, uh, su supporting the Christian Democrats in their election. 
But of course, let's not remember, let's not forget that my father and Shasha were on the leftist side. Mm. Uh, independent, but both very close to the uh, Communist Party, as uh, Italo Calvino, as Carlo Levi. Uh, Carlo Levi was uh, supporting my father's in uh, his electoral uh, campaign uh, in the, what was it, 66, 70s, these years. And uh, so it was the first time that uh, he had the courage through the story of an idiot uh, to, to say the truth to say the truth, that the bishop were landlord, and they were, uh, they were uh, making life difficult to poor people, and they were taking really money f out of their lives. They could not make a living with their, 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 their poor er, er, gains. So uh, Ishasha, in this story, <laughs> he gives to this mythological, character, the possibility uh, to, to say things how they are and, uh, and say the truth through the metaphor so that he would not go to jail. And this is typical all over the country where there is not the possibility to say things as they are because of lack of freedom. Uh, officially, we were free in the 70s. We could say what we wanted, but up to a certain point, it was not so evident to go against the church in an open way. Imagine that uh, um, at that time th still was going on censorship, strong censorship, and people would be uh, condemned and their name written in the, at the entrance of the churches. My, my father's name was at the entrance of, of the churches of, uh, in, uh, of the churches in Alcamo, where he was uh, uh, presenting himself as uh, um, a deputy of the Communist Party, of course. <laughs> so uh, uh, this is just small stories to make you uh, have an idea of, uh, of what was the situation in Sicily in the 70s. So that's it. Let's go back. Uh, um, the role of diaspora. The role of diaspora. We, we, as Sicilian, because of course I am Sicilian, uh, we have always been traveling around the world, but still we are not yet known with our her cultural heritage as much as we might deserve as anybody else, of course. What, uh, what was the contribution of Shasha doing his uh, traveling around the world? He was like um, an ambassador, a cultural ambassador. This was his role, and this is what uh, the Amici of Shasha, Leonardo Shasha, are doing nowadays, to keep alive the importance of an engaged intellectual. Why I'm using this word engage? Because the years where he, when when he was going to Paris were the years of uh, uh, of uh, Jean Paul Sartre, were the years of uh, Bernard Levi Strauss, uh, years where uh, the intellectual really wanted to say the words in society openly denouncing what was wrong or right more than what is going on nowadays. And, and, and these were the years where the human being was at the center of the attention. And that, in that, uh, the anthropology, uh, the anthropological school of Levi Strauss uh, uh, paved the way to uh, a, a new kind of, uh, of, of studies and uh, with a major attention uh, on the history of the humble and their production. And uh, in this sense, uh, uh, Leonardo Shasha, uh, let's say that, um, played an important role because he was uh, building the net of friendship which nowadays the Leonardo Shasha friends are keeping alive because uh, uh, it is important his legacy but his legacy would die if uh, each one of us would not give his own contribution from now onward. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much for even personal memories that can let us understand better what Sicily was in recent years. But even because you were talking about Sicily as the Sicily of Frederick II, Sicily of Roger II, the multicultural Sicily, which Greek, Jewish, and Muslim, along with Latin people, were, collab and, and, and were collaborating to create the modern world. We know how Sicily was important because without that kind of Sicily against the papacy and working closely with the Middle East um, was the possibility for Dante to be born. Because without that, the openness of the mind of Dante probably was impossible. And so Shasha found himself in the openness of Sicily and, and in the contradictory Sicily, obviously, as we can read in La Sicilia il suo cuore, so <coughs> the first book by Shasha in poetry, in which we can see the contradiction of a mythology that now is not smiling anymore to the son of Sicily, as he said. But so thank you very much for bringing us at that time that is the fundamenting of our civilization. And especially because actually you were introducing a Mara Lacour speech. And that I'm very happy to introduce, especially because this book was a Christmas gift <laughs> that I received <coughs> a few years ago. So Amara Lacour, that is very well known, is the author of five novels, three of which were written in both Arabic and Italian. His best known works are the much acclaimed Clash of Civilization over an elevator in Piazza Vittorio, 2008. Uh, a, a wonderful title, Divorced Italian Style. They remind us of wonderful movies uh, in season. Now your novel is 2012. And these disputes over a very Italian frigate, 2014. His novels have been translated from Italian into many languages, including English, German, French, Spanish, Dutch, Japanese, and Danish. And I hope he will be in Sicilian as well one day. Lacus has been awarded the Flaiano Prize in Italy in 2006 and Algerian's Booksellers Prize in 2008. And Lama Amara, he moved to New York City in 2014. He is currently a visiting professor at New York University. Amara, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Um, so thank you for inviting me. I'm really delighted to, to be here with you to celebrate um, Leonardo Sciascia, uh, one of the most uh, fantastic uh, writers and, um, and intellectuals. So Francesca uh, activated my memory. So <laughs> Uh, so I have some. I would, I would like to start with uh, with some memories. So my um, my relationship uh, with Leonardo Sciascia uh, started when I was a student at um, Algiers University, um, probably 1991. So one day I was in a bookstore. I was looking for books, and I found a book in French. Uh, Leonardo Sciascia. La mer couleur du vin. This is in Libre. This is the beginning. So I opened the book. So we are in Algeria. I mean, the wine is, you know, in Islam, wine is uh, just, you know, sea and wine. So I love the title. So I opened the book and I found the, yeah, it was, the, uh, was a short uh, selection of uh, short stories. It was, uh, I opened the book and I, I found the calligraphy in Arabic, Jufa was written in Arabic. So I said, that's it's unbelievable. It's, I opened it, it was, it was in, in Arabic. Um, and it was a, a, a fantastic discovery for me because, and this is very important to say, um, so I was born in Algiers uh, into a Kabyle family. I don't know if you, you know the history of Africa. Even, even Kabyle are like natives here. We are the natives of the North Africa. Uh, so my mother doesn't speak Arabic. Uh, uh, but the fact that um, I was born in, in, in Algiers, I was surrounded by, uh, by, by Arabs. And so I, I was uh, growing up with this, uh, this idea of identity as a closed space. So at home, they were saying, uh, we are Kabyle, and they were, and the neighbors are Arabs. 
but at school I had I had a lot of friends, so we were Arabs. So I didn't like that idea. Of course, Arabs were saying the same thing. We are Arab, we are Kabir. I didn't like this idea of identity as closed space. Um, so uh, even now, I mean, when we talk about our own but diversity, I always ask, what are the similarities? Okay, where are they? There, there is diversity, but what is the similarities? And this is the, the, one of the, the most important lessons that I learned from my childhood. I have five sisters and three brothers. Um, I am the sixth. Physically, we are different. So I can show you the, the family photo. We have blondes, we have, I'm in the middle like cappuccino, but we have darker too. I mean, mid-middle. So physically, we are, uh, we are completely uh, different. And we have the same mother and the same mother, the same uh, father. And we had the same education. We, we lived in the same house. But we are different, psychologically uh, different, uh, politically different. So I grew up with this idea of diversity is part of you know, of life. So when I opened that book with the, the short, the sel selection of short stories of Shasha and found, I found the, you know, the title in Arabic, I said, this is another reason, I mean, of looking for the similarities. Um, so in, uh, I visited Sicily, so I can't talk about Shasha without uh, talking about Sicily. Uh, so in 1995, I, I was uh, obliged to escape Algeria. I was working as a journalist, and I, I escaped Algeria. I went to Italy. I was, um, um, so I became a refugee. Uh, um, when you are a refugee or when you live in exile, you have one obsession every day. You want to come back, to go back to the, your country. This is the, so the, the first years were very hard, very, very hard. And uh, um, in 1997, um, uh, I was a student from university, and uh, um, uh, my professor, um, Bianca Scarcia Moretti, who passed away just two, two years ago, uh, organized uh, a trip uh, study in Sicily. So I went for the first time uh, to Sicily. We spent three... Uh, three weeks, and I found it was Algeria. I mean, I said to myself, this is a... So anyway, after coming back to Rome, I said to myself, each time I have nostalgia, I have this disease of Algeria, I, I, I have just to go to Sicily, and it worked. And so I went for years for, for Sicily. This is my relationship with, uh, with Sicily. In 2006, another uh, fantastic uh, memory, I won um, the the Raquel Mare Leonardo Shasha Prize. Um, the 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 president of the jury was uh, was Vincenzo Consolo. Uh, <laughs> I have a lot of memories about about Consolo. Uh, so anyway, I spent three or four days like star in uh, you know in uh, Raquel Muto, I, the mayor invited me in the, in the, to visit his, uh, his town. I went there and showed me the, you know, the foundation uh, of Shasha, the house where he lived. Uh, this is, an, I mean, another uh, fantastic uh, memory. And this is, more, this is just extra memories. And in, two, in 2000, um, 2009, So in, 2000, in September 2009, the Berlin International Literature Festival commemorated the 20th anniversary of Leonardo Shasha's death. My German publisher, Verla Klaus Wagenbach, who also publishes Shasha, invited me to participate in the event with the Sicilian writer Vincenzo Consolo, a close friend of Shasha and my mentor. I happily accepted the invitation. During my talk at the conference, I explained my depth to Shasha and my strong relationship with his works. First of all, as himself stated, Shasha's name is of Arabic origin, an inheritance that in many ways facilitated, facilitated my own integration into Italian literature. As Algerian, as a North African, I did not have to create new roots in Italy since they already existed. Secondly, Sasha, Sasha contributed in an essential way to my understanding of the role of religion in daily life. 
That is to say that religion must remain in the private sector and not invade the public sphere and, and politics. Shasha showed us that when religion enters the field of politics and even of science, it has negative effect on politics and itself in the indigent. For example, uh, he was obsessed with the Inquisition, which represented the transformation of religion, religious fundamentalism, the politicization of religion into torture and, and absolute torture. In Algeria in the 90s, I witnessed the disaster caused by terrorism through the politicization of Islam, a problem that has, has become global, has since become global. Thirdly, in, 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 in writing my novels, I have followed uh, Shasha's model of employing the detective story genre without a happy, happy ending. And this is a big uh, diversity, a big, um, big difference between the, you know, the, if, we, we, uh, if we want to understand the, the, the detective story, uh, uh, Shasha's detective story, is, is completely different than the you know the, the classical genre of detective story. Even the, you know the nor, nor the, the the now we have a fashion of the um, um, uh, um, of writers from nor Norway and uh, and the ending is all, even Sig Larsen in the, in the millennium. The ending is always the you know happy ending. But in Shasha, there is no happy ending. When you uh, even the, the the day of the owl, the Giorno della Civetta, we uh, you know we don't know who who is the, the who is the the who did it because the reason is is not uh, that in, it's not that important to know who who did it because the most important question is to understand who is behind them, the man, the mandatore or the mandante, the mandante. It's in Italian, it's unbelievable, it's a wonderful uh, um, word. Um, <clears throat> and exploring collective memory to narrate Italian uh, reality. Leonardo Sciascia, being the writer who, had, uh, who, has, who has had the greatest influence on me, um, I consider myself one of his uh, many heirs. What does his legacy consist and how to interpret it? This is the... This is, I mean, my question. Uh, uh, my perspective is uh, as a writer perspective. Uh, and this is my way to, to deal with writers, uh, dealing with their legacies. And this is hard to say that I, I mean, the, the major influence uh, on me is Shasha. And sometimes when, uh, when um, uh, especially in Algeria and Arab world, they say uh, I'm, uh, Arab writer because I write in Arabic, but my, um, um, but the origin, I mean, the source of creativity is not Arabic literature actually, it's, it's Italian, it's, it's, uh, it's Shasha. And I, I would like to give you um, some examples. Uh, so I'm going to give you two examples from two novels. So in my novels, three fundamental Shashan moral, political, and intellectual imperatives can be identified. Three. The first is um, uh, non lasciare la storia storici. Non lasciare la storia storici. So do not have, do not, uh, do not have history, do not leave history to historians. The second is uh, separate religion and politics. Separare la religione dalla politica. The third, difendere la legalità. Defend leg legality. De so uh, here I would like to 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 see uh, 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 two passages. Uh, it's, it's actually it's one passage I did the editing from Divorce Islamic Style. Uh, so Divorce Islamic Style is my um, um, ambitious uh, uh, novel. Uh, so I wrote a Clash of Civilization of an Innovator in Piazza Vittorio in Arabic, and in 2006 I published the Italian version. It's not a translation. It's the betrayal of the, of the original text. I mean, being the author, not the translator, I, I had the freedom to cut and to add and to adapt my text. Um, so the novel had a big success, and thanks to Francesca, she was a member of the Flaiano Prize. I won Flaiano uh, Prize. Um, so uh, in 2010, I um, I started working. I started working in this ambitious uh, novel um, 
writing the same novel in two languages, in Arabic and Italian. Uh, it was an incredible uh, adventure. Uh, maybe one day I have to, sh to, to write a story about this. Um, because I was crazy, I rented a room in uh, Vatican City. You know, it's unbelievable, it's uh, mystical. So I, uh, I was, I mean, I was working for, I mean, for, uh, I think for two months or three months alone, was uh, out of the world, uh, working every day. Each morning I had to, to, sh to divide the narration between two characters, uh, Christian uh, um, or Isa, uh, um, uh, Sicilian translator, and Sophia, the Egyptian woman. So each day I had to, to give the, and uh, give them the chance to choose which language that they want. If you want to talk to me in, in Arabic or in Italian, <laughs> I had to change the keyboard from Arabic to Italian. It was, it was a crazy experience. It's a crazy experience. <clears throat> so, um, so the story, just to give you the, so the novel was translated in, uh, so the, the novel came out in 2000, um, This is the Arabic, uh, the Arabic uh, cover, uh, and, and the title is different, Al Qahira Sagira, Little Cairo. Uh, but in Italian, Divorcio Islamica di Marconi. So the novel was translated by uh, Anne Goldstein, uh, so it's, uh, she is a fantastic translator, and uh, uh, wonderful, she is really wonderful. And she, she translated three novels, three of my novels, and um, so, this is why I'm going to read. Um, I'm going to read uh, in Italian. So I wrote the novel at the same time in Italian and uh, in the, in Arabic. Uh, and this is the Anne's um, uh, translation. It's a fantastic translation. <coughs> So in this passage, you can find, you know, the it's Shasha, uh, Shashian uh, uh, text. Um, so I, I want I want I want to show you the influence, you know, practically uh, the influence of Shasha. Sono un po' confuso e agitato. I pensieri e i ricordi mi invadono senza preavviso. Cerco di concentrarmi. Non so perché. Uh, ma mi torna in mente la, la, la buonanima di nonno Leonardo. Eravamo molto legati. Quando ero piccolo, ci sedevamo di fronte al mare a Mazzara del Vallo. Lui raccontava, io ascoltavo per ore senza mai stancarmi. Di storie ne aveva da riempire tanti libri. Era nato a Tunisi da una famiglia di immigrati trapanesi. Aveva vissuto lì fino all'adolescenza, prima di ritornare in Italia. Negli ultimi anni di vita desiderava tanto rivedere la sua città natale. Avrei voluto accompagnarlo. Purtroppo era molto malato, era malato di cuore, quindi non era il caso di farle rivivere emozioni forti, non avrebbe retto. Forse voleva proprio emozionarsi fino alla morte ed essere, ed essere si, si, si polto nella sua Tunisi, accanto alla madre. Mio nonno era una persona splendida, i suoi ricordi non erano mai malinconici. Sto leggendo la, vero? la pagina giusta. Mio nonno era una persona splendida, i suoi racconti non erano mai malinconici, riusciva sempre a tenere a bada la nostalgia, la buona bestia, così la chiamava. Piansi soltanto una volta, ricordando la madre, che aveva perso da piccolo. È stato lui ad insegnarmi le prime parole in arabo tunisino, Shesmek, come ti chiami? Eh... Eh... Shahwelek, I'm Algerian. <laughs> Shehwelek, win mishi, dove vai? Yezi, basta, nubrik barsha, ti voglio bene assai, e altre ancora. A Mazzara sono cresciuto in mezzo a tanti figli di pescatori tunisini. Stavamo sempre insieme a giocare, a litigare e poi a fare subito pace. Spesso mi scambiavano per uno di loro. Avevo una fisionomia tipicamente mediterranea e parlavo bene l'arabo tunisino. Sono stato a Tunisi la prima volta a 13 anni. Ci andai con i miei. Prendemmo la nave nel tardo pomeriggio e arrivammo al porto di Tunisi la mattina presto, del giorno seguente. Quella notte non riuscì a dormire. Ero rimozionato. Rimannemmo due settimane. Per, per me fu un viaggio indimenticabile. 
vede finalmente la terra dove erano nati i miei nonni. In seguito ci tornai diverse volte. Sto arrivando? Siamo... Ok. Quando arrivo mi... Ok, grazie. Dopo la maturità nessuno si, si, si sorprese della mia scelta di iscrivermi alla facoltà di lingua orientale. Volevo imparare meglio l'arabo. All'Università di Palermo mi mise a studiare l'arabo classico con determinazione e tanto entusiasmo. Mi piaceva molto proprio la grammatica che faceva, che faceva impazzire tutti, studenti e professore. Ero uno dei migliori e molti non credevano che fosse di madrelingua italiana. Adesso? Dedicai la mia tesi di laurea al soggiorno di Giuseppe Garibaldi in Tunisia. La ricerca fu molto difficile, non so perché le cose complicate mi piacciono tanto. Che ci trassi, Garibaldi, con la Tunisia? Che ci trassi? Che ci trassi? L'eroe dei due mondi arriva a Tunisi nel 1834 per sfuggire alla condanna a morte per insurruzione emessa dal Tribunale di Genova. Trascorre nella capitale tunisina un anno sotto il falso nome di Giuseppe Pane, lavorando per il Bey di Tunisi. Dopo il soggiorno tunisino continua la sua avventura da rivoluzionario in Brasile per sostenere i movimenti indipendentisti contro i portoghesi e spagnoli. Nel 1859 torna a Tunisi, ma le autorità li negano l'ingresso in seguito all'intervento del console francese. Per gli ammiratori locali Garibaldi continua a essere un eroe, un vero rivoluzionario, per i detrattori invece è soltanto un bandito, un pericoloso terrorista. Judah is the superior in the undercover operation. Uh, Giuda cerca di frenare l'entusiasmo e l'eccitazione dei suoi colleghi. È presto per pensare alla conferenza stampa. L'operazione Little Cairo non è ancora conclusa. Ci sono anzi due importanti questioni ancora aperte. Prima, primo, dove nascondono l'esplosivo? Secondo, chi è il candidato kamikaze? L'atmosfera degenera di quando James mette sul tavolo l'ipotesi di rapire l'imam Zaki. Antar le ricorda subito il caso dell'imam Abu Omar. La gente della CIA per tutta risposta accusa il colle i colleghi egiziani di dilettantismo. L'accordo non è stato rispettato. Abu Omar doveva scomparire. Antar non ci sta e rispedisce le accuse al mittente. Siete voi i veri dilettanti, vi siete fatte prendere come dei polli. Avete lasciato tracce dappertutto e poi cosa doveva, dovevamo, dovevamo fare con Abu Omar? Ucciderlo forse? Voi americani siete davvero insopportabili, ci accusate di non rispettare i diritti umani, poi ci chiedete di comportarci come il Ginare e il Pinochet. Il caso Abu Omar. Lo scandalo che sta mettendo in crisi i rapporti fra l'Italia e gli Stati Uniti. Giuda ne aveva già parlato, me ne aveva già parlato. La vicenda può essere riassunta come segue. Nel febbraio 2003, this is a true story. Nel febbraio 2003 una squadra di agenti della CIA rapisce a Milano in pieno giorno l'imam Abu Omar, un quarantenne egiziano che vive in Italia dal 1999 dopo aver ottenuto lo stato di rifugiato politico. So Abu Omar was like me, a refugee. È un quarantenne egiziano che vive in Italia dal 1999, dopo aver ottenuto lo status di rifugiato politico, è sospettato di aver legami con il terrorismo internazionale a causa della sua militanza nell'organizzazione egiziana Gamaa Islamia e la sua partecipazione alla guerra nell'ex Jugoslavia, al fianco dei musulmani bosniaci. Abu Omar viene subito trasferito alla base militare americana di Aviano, dove subisce torture e svari svariati interrogatori. Il giorno dopo viene imbarcato su un volo segreto <coughs> e trasferito in Egitto, nel terribile carcere di Tora, dove trascorre 14 mesi subendo altre torture. La moglie ne denuncia la scomparsa alla polizia italiana, ma di lui non c'è nessuna traccia. 
Finalmente, nell'aprile 2004, le autorità egiziane lo lasciano e Abu Omar si fa vivo con la, la, con la consorte e qualche amico di Milano. I magistrati italiani, che avevano iniziato a intercettare le sue telefonate, inizia, inizia, iniziano a indagare e scoppia il caso, il, caso, il, il, il caso Abu Omar. Lo scorso mese, so the story takes place in 2005, so here in 2000, lo scorso mese la procura di Milano ha chiuso l'indagine sul sequestro accusando gli agenti della CIA di aver violato la sovranità dello Stato italiano, ma gli interrogatori rimangono e i nostri servizi erano al corrente? E come è stato possibile riconsegnare un rifugiato politico al suo paese di origine? Cioè, come è possibile? Um, mi viene spontaneo pensare, ecco questo, questo forse a Shasha sarebbe molto piaciuto. Oh, sì. Se mi viene, se ci sto, no. okay. mi, viene, mi viene spontaneo pensare a Giuseppe Garibaldi, alle centinaia di oppositori politici manziani in Tunisia godevano della protezione del Bay di Tunisi. Nessuno ha mai pensato di consegnarle a Savoia. Occorre ricordare che su Garibaldi pendeva una condanna a morte. Sarebbe piaciuto a Shasha di lei. <ride> Sapendo, insomma, la, insomma, ok. This is very personal, uh, personal uh, story, because I was a refugee. Uh, and when you are a refugee and you have the, the official protection, so this is the... Um, so I'm, I'm very happy and proud to, be, to, 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 um, to tell this story. Uh, and this is here, too. Uh, I, 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 did, I didn't leave the history to historians as a writer, and, uh, and this defending legality. Uh, if, um, if Abu Omar was guilty, so the vision, the word vision of Abu Omar is completely different than mine. So we are completely different. We have a different view of one. But he was a refugee, and if, the, if he was guilty of something, and actually, They were, um, uh, uh, they were in investigation about him. They were, they, there was a pr in process, an investigation about him to see if he has some. So if he was guilty, you know, the trial, and you know, they sent him in the, in the prison. But he was, you know, uh, uh, anyway. So In 2000, this is another example. So in 2000, uh, actually last, um, last May, with Francesca as, as a respondent, I gave a talk at uh, Colombia. My t the title of my, uh, my, uh, my talk was um, Exporting Shasha to Arab World. Um, because after living many years in, Italian, in, Ita in Italy and uh, writing in Italian, In 2000, uh, 2019, I, I decided to, to export what I learned uh, from Italian literature, from Italian language, um, to export Shasha in Arab world, because in Algeria, because I found that uh, the best way to, to understand and to narrate Algeria today, I thought was Italian comedy style, la comedia italiana, but I was wrong. I found that the best way is Shasha's uh, model. So in 2019, um, actually I, I, uh, I published this novel, but I was working for many years, at least for five or six years. And uh, in 2018, I went to Algeria. I, I lived in Algeria. Uh, 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 I, was, I wasn't in Algeria, so I went to Oran. Uh, so I spent uh, two years there, so to write about. Uh, so I wrote, um, i wrote a novel uh, called uh, Perlil, the, 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 the Night Bird. It's about 60 years of Algerian history. The story t t starts in uh, 1958 during the French colonization, the last years of the, the French colonization, until 2018. So I have four characters. In, 2000, uh, in 1958, they were 18. Um, um, And they became fighters, fighters for the, for the Algerian independence. And in 2000, 
in 2018, there are 80. So I, I found the structure in the novel and I, uh, I, I chose uh, um, um, a very crucial uh, moment of Algerian history. Because history is not a, a chronological, it's, it's not the accumulation of the years. Uh, I think it's the same thing with individuals. So our lives, there are uh, some years or some moments in our life that are very important. And on, for example, when I became father, my identity ch changed, changed. This is a very important event for me. Uh, so in Algerian history, I chose, uh, uh, I think, seven or eight uh, uh, moments. So uh, 62 is Algerian independence. Uh, 65 it was the coup, Boumedien, Houari Boumedien, the coup, military uh, coup. Um, um, 1976, another very important moment because after the coup, the uh, Boumedien decided to, um, to freeze the Algerian constitution. Uh, in 1976, the, the, uh, there was a new constitution and the new election, uh, it's, it's, it was an opportunity, uh, but there was a false opportunity. Uh, um, 19, uh, 1988 was Arab, the Arab Spring, Algerian Arab Spring. Uh, you can say I was, I was, I was uh, 18 at that time. Uh, and then there are two or three moments. So in each moment I went back to, I go back to see my characters who are doing the, their lives. This is, the, this is the structure of the, and it's a very Shashen novel. Really, uh, there's a there's a murder in the beginning, uh, and you know the and the ending. The ending is very Shashen because uh, uh, there is the truth, you know, but the the power for because the 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 um, the victim we say victim here the, who killed is uh, is a fighter. is very important fighter. So he was killed, and the day of Algerian independence. July 5th, you know, and they don't want to, you know, to show that he was killed. And they changed the, 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 the truth in the last, uh, uh, they say just a heart attack. In yeah, this is the, so I would like to read a passage from this, uh, from the, so the, the, now we have, there's a, there's a translation in English. Uh, the, the book was translated by Alexander Ellinson. Uh, the book is now is an, uh, will published in French uh, in the beginning of the year, Actes Sud, my French publisher, and hopefully in English, in English uh, soon. So the story, the story takes place in downtown Oran, northwest Algeria, on the morning of the anniversary of the country's independence. A former fighter in the struggle for freedom is found murdered. Karim Sultani, head of the anti-terrorism unit, cuts short his holiday to take charge of the case. Three questions are on his mind. Who killed Milut Sabri? Who, why on, his, on this day in particular? And does this mean a return to the 90s years of terror and the killings of the opponents? This is the, the plot of the, the story. So I'm going to read the a passage. So here we are. We are in 19, we are in 1965, uh, after Bumdien's uh, Wari Boumedien, by the way, is the, was the, uh, was, uh, the head of the army. And then um, uh, after the independence, Bimbella, Ahmed Bimbella, became uh, first president. And after three years, you know, the, uh, the, uh, he decided to, you know, to, to do the coup. Um, so here we are in, the, in 1965. Uh, so Dries Talbi is one of the four friends, the, the fighters. Uh, Dries Talbi explained his opposition to the idea of, as, of as, ascending to power on top of tanks. No country can flourish and enjoy stability when the military gets involved in political life. Military coups by their, uh, by their very nature demolish all plans to build a cohesive uh, country. He cited, he, cited, he cited the example of Syria, which witnessed four bloody military coup in just two years, between 1949 and 1951. The revolutionary uh, redress, the general, the, I mean, Idris, 
Joyce Talbi addressed the general boom at the end, was calling, uh, was calling for was a piece of, of greed in the eye. His goal was not to protect the revolution and defend the interests of the people. Rather, it was to grab the reins of power and get ri ri rid of his rebel, Bimbella. Dries also, and this is the best uh, part, this is the best part. D Dries also said that he was uncomfortable with the, with the, with the, with the Boumedien for another reason, connected to his nom de guerre, Houari Boumedien. Uh, it, was, it wasn't that he had gotten r r rid of his real name, because the real name of Boumedien was Mohammed Bukharouba. Mohammed Bukharouba. And during the war, you know, during the war, Algerians uh, fighters uh, was uh, chose to have the the the, the, uh, um, the, the what's the Non de guerre, to protect their, their families. In this way, the French, they couldn't, you know, find who, this is the why they, but the problem after the independence, this, they, you know, they continued to, to have the non de guerre. Uh, uh, and the, the, the very strange thing about Algerian secret service uh, in Algeria, they had all the non de guerre. Uh, it's like, they are fighting with, against their people. This is the dictator sanctuary. They are fighting there. They had uh, not the guerre. The war was finished, and they had uh, anyway. And was the you know the the it wasn't counter uh, counter espionage you know outside. They were inside. Anyway, um, Dries also said that he was uncomfortable with the with the Boumediens for uh, for another reason connected to his non de guerre, Houari Boumedien. It wasn't that he had gotten rid, rid of his real name, Mohammed Bukharouba. Rather, it was that he incorporated the names of two righteous saints, Sidi Huwari and Sidi Boumedien. So in Algeria, we have two big saints. One in, the, uh, one in Oran, Sidi Huwari, it's a saint. And in Tlemcen, very, it's, it's about one hour from Oran, there's another saint, very important, Boumedien. So he chose two saints. So this is his comment. Does he, does he want Algerians to sanctify him? Is he stri striving to be a ruler or one of God's greatest saints? Does he want to make Algeria a country that doesn't fade away as men do, as he says, or a Sufi Zawiya for pilgrims and seekers of, of Baraka benediction in Arabic and blessings from the righteous? Why mix religions and politics? This is the, it was a critic about using, uh, you know, instead of talking about the Islamist, the, the, you know, the fundamentals that use. So this is the, and this is about, you know, mixing religion and, and politics. So the, um, to conclude, The relationship of Arabs with Italy is not only linked to the phenomena of recent immigration that dates back to the Arab conquest of Sicily, which lasted more than two centuries. It, it is not uh, erroneous, therefore, to say that Arabs have not arrived in Italy, but rather have returned. Uh, Vincenzo Consolo wrote a fantastic book called, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a selection of uh, essays, Al, Al di là del faro. Al di là del faro. And uh, Al di là del faro was translated from Norma, Norm, Norma Bouchard and Massimo Lolini, uh, reading and writing the Mediterranean. He translated the, so I would, I would like to uh, quote uh, Consolo. It's widely known that with the end of Latin in the Middle Ages, the dialect from Tuscany came to dominate other regional languages in Italian literature. This, ha this happened thanks to the three great fathers of Italian literature, Dante, Petrarch, and Boccaccio. However, it's, although, it's also widely known that the first nucleus of the Italian language, or volgare, as it was called, took shape in Sicily, that the first poets in Italian were Sicilians. The poets of so-called Sicilian school of poetry who had uh, gathered at the, the Parlimitan court of the Emperor Frederick uh, II, or who wrote it around it. 
Dante asserts as much in his Vulgare Eloquencia at, at court, the world composed poetry in Sicilian. That is to say, in a language that was blend of many languages in which there were also echoes of Arabic. Indirectly, the inhabitants of the island of Sicily began to have a Sicilians uh, after Arab conquest held Sasha, who therefore firmly said the beginning of what we call the Sicilian way of being in the period of Arab domination. Arab culture was incisive in the island, above all in the western part that raises um, to the heights of Mazzara and Palermo, where the signs of Arab influence have injured for more than a millennium in the character of people, their appearance, their customs, their architecture, their language, their literature, both popular and not. So what I, 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 this, what I found in my, during my first trip in Sicily in 1997. Thank you. So thank you very much. And I think it, it, it's very important now to understand where our colloquium is standing. Because when we talk about the American reception of Leonardo Sciascia, we go to documentation. We need to read Primo Levi's letter to the president. And later, as we shall see this afternoon, we'll unveil our, our, our archives and uh, overlook documents to understand the relationship between Shasha and the United States. When we come back from the United States to the Mediterranean and see, we see personal memories, and we see how history is the transmission of the past, obviously in a way, but since we are living in a world that tends to forget, it's always nice to remember that. And so we started from Frederick II, as I introduced you, and Amara finished on Frederick II. And about that, on personal memories and Sicily, I would like to invite you to, to, to show us the books that you kindly brought to us, since it are a fable about Sicily. And, and so I would like to, if you can come here, please. This is out of the program, so please be excited, please. <laughs> Yes, I'm sorry, I, I wasn't prepared to any, uh, give any talk or anything, but it's a very personal memory, and thanks for this occasion. I moved recently to New York, and I'm a Sicilian. I grew up in Palermo, and uh, I left uh, now many years ago, so I've been traveling the world since then, and uh, there are few things that travel with me <laughs> in uh, Asia, Africa, or wherever I've been. And one of these is uh, Il Fuoco nel Mare by Leonardo Sciascia. It's a um, fabrication of uh, 1975 and was a present of uh, my parents in one occasion. I was uh, a young girl at that time. Um, it wasn't the first book I. I read of Shasha, in fact, I think the first one was Il Mare Colore del Vino. And, uh, and then the others follow. Um, I think if I may say something meaningful after the talk, the presentation that they were so interesting and uh, um, which uh, it's my mine is only a witness of a, of a of a reader, but if I may say of a, I was a very young reader at the time. Um, the thing everything comes together in what I have heard today. There is one thing as a reader that personally I reckon is important to to say, and this uh, as it is here is the language uh, is the. Um, uh, the lyricism, the interesting um, how contemporary Shasha would have been. And uh, um, I was a reader of Calvino and Natalia Ginsburg that have been connected, and the Levis, the two as well. And there is, of course, the civic and the intellectual connection between these writers. But there is, and possibly with you, there is also that connection. Um, 
is the, 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 the creation of the language in the novel. And the fact that the language and intellectual um, reasoning are actually connected. Um, it is explicitly said in the Importe Aperte, there is that uh, very famous dialogue between the protagonist and uh, the judge that say uh, they encounter and uh, the judge that became successful in life says, uh, you see, you were giving me always very bad marks when I was your uh, students, your pupil, and uh, I had always three or four in Italian, which was a very low mark, very bad marks. And now you see where I am, like I, I did a good career and socially. And the replay from the old teacher uh, is, uh, you see, I, I see your point, but I still think you would have bad marks in Italian because the Italian is not, he says l'italiano with the pomp that the judge would have attached to the Italian as a language is not academic. That was the replay. Is also the reasoning. So, what we speak or we write is also um, connected to what we think. And uh, there is a lot of, uh, I think, uh, this apart from the civic intellectual commitment. I think in in us as a young reader, particularly. If Sicilian grew up in the 80s, War of Mafia and all of that. There is a lot of that curiosity. And uh, here in New York, I think it would be fashionable in the educational system to say critical thinking. Um, at the time, I would say, is the fact of not to disconnect uh, your intellectual curiosity. So if you if you love art, you may be interested in history, in fact, in recollecting memories or in science or in legality. And, uh, and that can come together in a, in a good lyrical language. Um, so this is El Foco nel Mare, uh, illustrated by Simone Sautier. Uh, it's a beautiful edition and uh, is uh, the uh, story of Colapesh that is one of the Mediterranean legends uh, that form a oral background of the Sicilian culture and the Mediterranean culture as well. Colapesh is half man, half fish and uh, is hired by Federico II to found, uh, like it's, it's challenged by the king to find treasure in this underworld uh, city, um, fabulous cities under the Strait of Messina. So it's, it's, a, it's a mystery that has to do with uh, Mediterranean coast and it's a beautiful myth and legend and the writing is um, poetic is lyrical, is beautiful. Um, there is, I conclude this one because I really wasn't prepared, so I don't want to be too long. Um, is the start in which it, it describes where all this story starts. And uh, I may read in Italian, is uh, the test say, dove l'Italia con la punta del piede si appena distratto furtiva si muove colpisce la Sicilia di un calcio che la fa rimbalzare in Africa, pesante d'oro e di piombo e il piede d'Italia. In quel punto dove il faro e perciò si chiama Borgo di poche case, Torre del Faro, nacque al tempo che Federico II regnava con la pesce. And this is the beautiful um, opening of where the stuff take place and this is where Italy with the strong and uh, and heavy kick, push this ball that is the last, uh, the last um, limb of, of the Mediterranean Europe, uh, kick it towards Africa. That is where Colapesce was born. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a beautiful memory from Shasha 
um, legacy. Um, and also the fact that the book is beautiful with this beautiful illustration has something in my memory to do with Chasha. And this, uh, um, the thing that was mentioned here earlier about uh, uh, the beauty that is in art, but the beauty that is also in the art craft and the, in the everyday things we use. Uh, Shasha is um, in this collection of uh, his, uh, um, is the um, il risvolti di copertina is the la, la felicità di far libri by Sellerio. There is a collection of of uh, the book that he edited that, that he chose to publish with maybe the choice of the illustration or, or the book cover um, and the comment. There is a lot about the the idea of being happy to, to make books as well, to read them and to, to enjoy them. And it's not only uh, something uh, by um, kind of very intellectual curiosity, it's also about the pleasure that you can have in, uh, in making something beautiful, something good, something meaningful, that in some way it's an attempt to, to uh, a process, a research that then uh, is published. So it's interesting to, to for me as a reader and also as, uh, um, as a person that grew in that atmosphere where, as it was also mentioned here earlier, the um, uh, civic commitment of a group of writers and intellectual and artists was extremely important to modernize and to uh, mm, regain uh, some sort of uh, European and international and Mediterranean stage to Sicily and Palermo in particular, outside the, I mean, the, 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 the war or mafia or the ethnic or cliche. I think this aspect of the importance of the language research, the process, uh, the reasoning, uh, the ability of uh, uh, research is, is very important. And uh, It's very important that the book, as you said, is a, is a piece of art a and a screen of memories, yeah. as you actually you are the witness of. So thank you very much for Thanks. being here. Thank you. Thank you. So, <laughs> If there are any questions, we have 15 minutes. So if you have, please, questions about our session. So for our speaker. Well, I wanted to thank both the speakers. And I have a question for Amara, because I've been, I've been reading your work for quite a while now. And uh, of course, as a reader of your work, I know that there is a strong connection to Shasha that also grows with your work. It becomes more evident and stronger, but I had no clue that Vincenzo Consolo was your mentor. And, and now it's activating a lot of things that I would have n never thought. I, and I think, you know, in many of the interviews and essays about you that I read, Shasha is mentioned, but I never read the, the name of Consolo. Maybe th this is a guy. And, and I wanted to ask you if you can expand on the Sicilian genealogy of your work and the role of Consolo there, which, Surprises me, but maybe it doesn't surprise me, you know? You were asking me if um, or, you know, talk about uh, Vincenzo Consolo. I, I met Vincenzo Consolo the first time. Actually, he came uh, in Algeria in, during the, the beginning of the, I think, of terrorism with the uh, international parliament. Guaiti Solo, a group of uh, intellectuals and writers. He, he came to Algeria to support the Algerian uh, intellectuals, and I, I didn't uh, meet him meet him there. So I met uh, Vincenzo Consolo the first time in 2002 at Biella. And when I, I introduced myself, I said I'm Algerian, 
and I saw joy in his eyes. It's really eyes. It was really fantastic. He started talking about, you know, the uh, the positive part, the positive, um, you can say, the, the positive history. Because after September 11, 2001, you know, they were, they were in Italy, they were, you know, people saying that um, they, um, even at the time, the, the president of the Senate, um, Pera, what's the Forza Berlusconi uh, parties, Francesco Pera, it's a Pera Francesco, anyway, Pera. Yes, Marcello Pera. He said that there is an incompatibility between Islam and uh, Occident. And you know, it's, he canceled you know, centuries of history. Um, so when I talked to a uh, uh, consul, it was the opposite. He was just saying the, the positive things about the... I was really impressed. And we became, we became, um, we became friends, you can say. And uh, when uh, my novel, Clash of Civilizations, over in Levita and Piazza Vittorio came out, I sent him, I sent him a copy. And um, I went to Milan for the presentation, and um, so uh, Consolo invited me in his house, and I, I met his, his wife, Caterina. And uh, then we went for the presentation, and he said fantastic uh, things about, uh, about my, my books, my book. And <laughs> for the, the Flaiano, I have a very a nice story about the, the, fla, the sorry, not Flaiano, the Recalmari Leonardo Sciascia. Uh, the story uh, was um, told me by one of the jury of the, of the prize. So the second day, I don't remember his name, when I, was in, uh, when I went to, uh, to Sicily to Grot for the, for the, the, for the, the prize, so the, one of the jury told me the, the story. He said, uh, I, after two, two days, or, uh, in, in, he said, uh, when, um, one day, Consolo called us, saying, this year, we have to, to give a prize to Amara Lacus. <laughs> this is an authoritarian. <laughs> Was the, so the, the, the member, they had, uh, there is a parenthesis, they, they had the trouble with, uh, with uh, Calmari, uh, Shasha, uh, the consul was the, the president, and then I think they wanted to give the, the prize to um, Camilleri, and uh, consul didn't like really a lot uh, Camilleri. Anyway, there is there was uh, there were there were uh, problems there. So when uh, consul told uh, told the jury and the, and the group that they are going to give, uh, they, they don't they didn't want. The, but the guy, the the member of the jury, said to me, he said, Amara Lacus. Who is Amara Lacus? Who is this woman, Amara Lacus? <laughs> so it's a no one, a no one, a no one, a no one nah, name, and we are risking him. He didn't say anything to Consolo. So Consolo gave him the name of the, the, the title of the book. They said we, we went right, right away to the, 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 the bookstore, we got the copies. And the, 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 the member jury said, I started reading the, the first page. The first page of Clash of Civilizations, it's about, about the refugee, Iranian refugee eating the pizza in the, in the subway. He said, he said, I couldn't, you know, it was a risk for the, the price. Uh, and we didn't have, you know, we didn't want to have a problems uh, uh, around it. So he said, I called Vincenzo. He said, Vincenzo, uh, are you sure this is the, the book, you know? Uh, the, uh, uh, and Consolo asked him, he said, did you, uh, did you finish the book? He says, no, I'm reading the first page. The, 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 he, said, he, said, he, said, he, he told him, when you finish the book, call me. And the member of the jury said, of course, I didn't call him back. So he read the book, and he loved it, and this, this, that. So uh, in 2000, um, and uh, I, I met Consolo several times uh, you know, in Rome, and book, uh, book fair, actually. In 2007, there was a, there is a fantastic documentary about uh, him, um, Consolo Lisola. There is a French uh, documentary. Uh, she did a, a documentary about him, and he wanted me inside. So there is a sequence in the documentary talking, you know, Consolo about Sicily, and uh, he wanted me in the documentary. Anyway, 2009, as I said, mentioned before, we met in Berlin. Uh, it was a fantastic night. We spent, uh, there was a, a time director of the uh, Italian Institute in, uh, in Berlin. We spent that night, it was the last, uh, the last, I mean, the last uh, meeting. In 2012, um, 
the, the Egyptian Academy in Rome, they were, um, they were uh, preparing the celebration of the century of uh, Nagi Mahfouz, the, the greatest uh, Arab writer, Nagi Mahfouz. And they asked me uh, to suggest a name of Italian writer. So I said, immediately, uh, Vincenzo Consolo. And they asked me to, to be the mediator. So I called him. So Caterina, his wife, responded. She said, he's, uh, he's very, um, he's very uh, ill. And, um, um, and uh, after seconds, Consolo took uh, the, so he wanted to, t to, to talk to me. So his, his voice was really, very really super tired. Um, so he thanked me and he said, I'm sorry, I can't. Uh, and few, I think few, few uh, weeks uh, later, he, he died, passed away. So he's fantastic. He's the in the Tridunion, we say, with, uh, with, with Shasha. And Francisco, of course, it's another fantastic friend. They are, you know, a group of friends. I didn't, I didn't meet uh, um, um, Shasha, but fortunately, I have uh, this fant fantastic friends. They, you know, they connect you too. Uh, I'm looking forward to chatting with Amara um, informally after this with a lot in common. I was actually on the jury of the Flyano Prize for a couple of years, <laughs> but not in 2006, so I, I was not responsible for you actually getting it. But I also knew Vincenzo Consolo very well, and I translated the only novel of his which is available in English, Il Sorriso del Ignoto Marinaio. Translating it, I was going to discuss this, and I will defer it a bit. Translating it was a nightmare, I have to say, uh, precisely because of the very rich artistic style which he deliberately uses, and also because he uses so much dialect in it, which he did as part of his own um, artistic belief. And I remember, I don't know if I can give me one... Um, I translated Il Sorriso mainly in Tuscany. I had the incredible bit of luck that the people living in a villa quite close to ours actually came from Le Madonie. So they helped me with words which I couldn't find. When there were words which they didn't know, and there were many, they would phone some woman whom they simply called La Comare. Now, I have no idea who La Comare actually <laughs> was. And I, I presume she's not with us anymore, but I owe her so much. But I remember a particular one word, and the word was Alianó, which I couldn't find. I'd looked up the dictionaries, the Fanfani dictionary. I'd spoken to these two friends. They had phoned La Comare, and she didn't know what it was. So I had to ask Vincenzo Consolo, and he said, ha, with a smile, in the village of Macari, in the province of Trapani, the village of maybe 200 people, he'd been there once and he'd heard this word, which means a, a flower, by the way, a lily. And he thought it was a beautiful word um, with very musical word, so he introduced it into his prose. The fact that only 200 people in one village, <laughs> um, perhaps not even one of them would have opened a book, only 200 people in this one village of Macari uh, would have recognized uh, the word and the rest of Sicily, let alone the rest of Italy, didn't make any difference to him. What he was concerned with was just the beautiful, mellifluous musicality of the word, and so he put it in. But I got to know him, I stayed with him too, and he actually came to Scotland um, on one of his first visits and made a big, big impression. But uh, I agree with you, he was a marvelous novelist, not an easy novelist, very friendly to me, not in it, not an easy man, uh, he certainly detested Camilleri, that, that's uh, another story. Anyway, we'll perhaps talk about him when we're discussing translation this afternoon, but I, I agree that he was a great novelist. Um, it's such a pity that he's not better known, but translating him really, really is a major undertaking with very, very considerable difficulty. Yes, uh, so obviously thank you to uh, both speakers. I have, a, I have a question for both of you. Um, and um, one kind of 
piggybacks on what Alessandro was saying about uh, Amara Lacus and, and kind of Sicilian dimension, right? I, I think of you as, you know, uh, Amara al Sicili, a little bit like even Hamdis, right? The, the Sicilian. Um, but reading your uh, novels, I'm um, always struck also by the kind of um, role that women play, right? And so I um, wonder if you could talk about, you know, when you talk about Nonno uh, Leonardo, I think, you know, there must be also some grandmother there, right? And I, I see Asia Jebar. Uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, if there's any kind of connection with, with, with her. Um, and then I obviously um, have a uh, question for uh, Professor Corrao, and I was struck by um, the kind of archival research that Domenico Scarpa is doing, right? And the letter by, um, by Primo Levi asking Shasha, yeah, asking Shasha about the Arab etymology of uh, uh, Marsa. Um, and um, obviously Shasha says, I don't know, I have to check, I'll ask. Uh, but I was struck by the fact that Primo Levi asks the question in the first place. So my question to you is, was Shasha's reception, and this is the mid 80s, right, 1984, um, I know that uh, Calvino writes to Shasha talking about Al Andalus um, and and the you know that 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 world, uh, but was that the re reception and impression that Italian intellectuals had of Shasha at the time? I mean, was he the spokesperson for this Arab Mediterranean in the eighties? Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, this question. Uh, actually, Shasha was writing many articles on newspapers. I was mentioning uh, Giornale Lora, but he also used to write on Corriere della Sera. And, uh, and for instance, uh, he wrote a lot about uh, uh, Arabic etymology of Sicilian words. So Marsa is one of the many because he started say, explaining uh, the meaning of Shasha in Arabic of his own name and other name of cities. And uh, it is also true, for instance, when I was mentioned, I mean, I didn't go deep in all the things uh, I, I read about him. But when he wrote about Ibn Hamdis the first time, that was very early. It was not when I published my book, which was in 87. He wrote 10 years earlier. And he wrote, in, uh, I think, in Corriere della Sera about uh, the publication of a book uh, uh, that was published in a not very known uh, publishing house, um, Flacovio in Palermo. And, um, and, but he was able to make it uh, uh, at the center of, uh, of the Italian uh, um, um, discussion on, on literature. And he was not only one, because that's why I was uh, hinting to the importance of uh, Salon Littéraire, the modern one, because uh, also Italo Calvino. How did Italo Calvino learned about Giuffa because uh, Italo Galvino in his Fiabe Italiana is collecting seven stories of Giuffa taken from uh, the Sicilian ethnologue uh, Pitre. And, uh, and this again was also thanks to these di internal private discussions. So that's why it's, it, it, you can find the letter, but at times there are no letters, but at the same time, of course, uh, uh, Italo Calvino and Shasha met many times in Milano and in Rome. And, uh, and that is uh, um, a, a way through meeting, and the other one is through newspapers and, uh, and printing, because uh, it was very much appreciated, of course. And, th and that was uh, for intellectual uh, connections and political. That, that is also important. Because it's, as I said before, Shasha was friend of Gutuso, Gutuso was friend, friend of Carlo Levi, and then my father and many others, and they were all friends of Calvino because he was uh, the intellectual of the Italian Communist Party, and, and the publications they were uh, read among the, uh, the I mean, that, that's uh, his uh, milieu, intellectual milieu, which uh, the, from where you find uh, through different newspapers and his letters uh, and build up uh, the, the, um, <coughs> the discussion of that period. Thank you. <laughs> Quickly, uh, you asked uh, Salvatore a question about uh, Asia Jabbar. Asia Jabbar is one of the, the greatest Algerian writers. Um, 
and there is a, there is a, a, a big similarity between um, uh, a deep similarity, sim uh, similarity between Shasha and Asya Jabbar. Asya Jabbar uh, studied the history, and he was, she was professor at history of history. She, I think, she started, she she taught uh, history at uh, in Morocco in, like, and in Algiers, University of Algiers. And she, in her in her novels, history is uh, is very is very important. It's uh, so. Um, uh, as uh, she couldn't publish, uh, she couldn't um, she couldn't publish books about history. The reason because the, the censorship in Algeria at the time, the sixties or the seventies, the, the um, were very very strong. So she chose literature as an instrument, and she put history in her novels. And this is, I mean, what uh, what I, s I said before, mentioned before about Shasha. Don't leave historian uh, history to historians. She did it as uh, as a historian. This is the particularity of uh, of Asiyajuba. She is really, uh, I, I have another uh, uh, other uh, memories about her. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much for this other uh, insightful uh, session. And now we have uh, a light lunch and we would like the Comitato Nazionale per le celebrazioni di Shashane would really like to invite the audience as well if you wish to have a light lunch with us in the library here, uh, just out of the room on the right. And so we can discuss and continue asking questions to future speakers and past speakers. So thank you very much to Amara Lacus and Francesca Maria Corral. Thank you.